Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. Today is August 2nd, 2023, and I'm going to be going over an interview and giving my opinion on uh, just this video. I have not read the book. The video is called The Trouble with White Women, An Evening with Kyla Schuler and Jules Jill Peterson. And uh, I have not read the book. So I'm just going by what they're saying on this video. I've watched other videos with uh, Jules Jill. He, they are an interesting person. That's for sure. They're an associate professor. They remind me a lot of uh, Dr. Blair Peters. I don't know how these people are getting into high, such high positions. Well, I do know they're being trained to be in these positions and try to gaslight that you can be any sex you want. And that is not true. It is not true. Let's get started with the video. Welcome. Hi, Hello. 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 Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. And thank you so much, Kyla, for, um, for inviting me to be in conversation with you tonight. I just want to reiterate that oh. call to everyone. Like, this is a beautiful, gorgeous book. Um, and, you know, I feel like it's a really delightful object, perfect for the holiday season. And dare I say, a great book to buy the white women in your life, potentially, <laughs> but not just the white women. <laughs> I will say, as uh, I really related to the foreword by Brittany Cooper, you know, talking about reading this, well, she was talking about reading it as, as a black feminist, and for me, reading it as a brown woman and woman of color feminist, um, just really... Yeah, I feel such a sense of gratitude for this book that, um, yeah, I kind of wanted to say it's like, it does a couple of things that are really rare and then I promise I have some questions of it, but I just can't help but soapbox for a moment, you know, I mean, Carly, you and I are both, are both scholars by training and have written, you know, traditional kind of academic monographs, um, which are their own peculiar beast um but there's something really moving to me about a book that is both really comprehensive and deep and and well researched i mean like it has all the receipts that you could ever need it is also really incredibly narratively engaging it's just like actually that word narrative comes up a lot i've never heard the word narrative so much as i've heard it in the last three or four months a page turner i have to say i just was like devouring it um, over the past uh, week or so and um it's also a book that i think on the one hand we feel truly now more than ever like we need this book like that that will be something i want to talk about tonight like right now right this moment i mean the trouble with white women might as well be the subtitle to almost every headline in the news um what is that supposed to mean White women are causing all the trouble in the world. Is that where we're going to now? They've, uh, the men, uh, I don't know what to say about the men's fight in this. They all say that they've been downtrodden and they have. Well, it's time for them to stand up for themselves too and speak out. Our ancestors have not had it easy. We have the easiest ever right now. And why are they trying to blame everything on white women now? I'm a white woman. I'm not racist. I'm not transphobic. I am not out causing trouble. I'm not getting arrested. Uh, I'm sure that this video won't be very well, you know, taken by society, this new society narrative that they're trying to build, but I want my voice out there. You know, it's been a struggle for everyone during history. How can they judge things that people did 100 years ago, 200 years ago? to the life we live now. It's been about a struggle for everybody. That's the reason they did all those things. They wanted to make life easier for themselves. And people have been overpowering people since the beginning of time. It's only been recently that we don't do it. And I think that that's good that we don't do it, but you can't bring today's standards into the, you know, how they had to get by and survive. And, uh, you know, we're here. So they did what they had to do. And I'm not sure exactly what she's talking about, because back when there were slaves, women didn't have any rights either. Women were speaking for their own rights. And I'm sorry that they didn't speak up for the black women's rights. But like I say, back then, it was a dog eat dog world. And 
you can't judge them by today's standards, in my opinion. But it's also a book that feels like it's centuries in the making. And well, it's it is. In the sense that it's about something that's been centuries in the making. It is. Um, and so I just really wanted to offer that as a kind of uh, framing meditation and, and a kind of gratitude um, for, for something that, you know, I think is really, really hard to pull off. And as a writer and a historian and a fellow traveler, um, I'm just really grateful for that. So thanks so much for it. Thank you, Jules. <sighs> Did you say fellow traveler? Really, really hard to pull off and as a writer and a historian and a fellow traveler. Fellow traveler. Um, there you go. For that, so the um, racist, so she, racist against the, themselves. Um, well, maybe, maybe we could actually start there. Fellow and, traveler. And so that's the way we were sort of thinking of proceeding tonight is uh, Kyle and I will talk for a bit, um, but please, as we're talking, feel free to, to throw. And generally, I know the saying is fellow, fellow passenger. But they are all up in the, everybody's butt about the pronouns. I think they should be a, a little more careful about how they're talking. Some questions down um, in the bottom of the screen, and they'll be banked there, and then I can um, relate them, and then we can, we can go from there. Um, but I thought maybe for folks um, who are tuning in who haven't had a chance to, to read the book yet, you know, I wonder, I think one of the really interesting things that this book does is it does make this like very reasoned historical argument, right? It is not just a sort of splashy title. And actually we've seen all these kinds of puck. Splashy? It's offensive and it's instigating trouble. It, like I say, I have not read the book, but if somebody came and gave me that book that uh, well, I'm imagining the people that are going to give it to the white women is going to be uh, black women or trans women. So they can all tell us what's wrong with us. I believe that us and the black women, we all want the same thing. We want our children safe. As soon as more women start waking up and realize, yeah, this could happen to your kid and there's nothing you can do about it. I think that um, women, all women of color, Muslim women, Christian women, they don't want their children taken and mutilated they don't pieces and sort of journalistic or or even let's be honest like social media hot takes about white women right but you actually take time to label and describe something called white feminism that you argue is a sort of remarkably stable i think is the phrase that you use formation now this uh, white feminism I, I first hearing of it today I grew up during all the feminist uh, period. You know, I seen the women that fought for our rights and they fought for, for gay rights and they fought for black rights. We wanted everything to be nice. We wanted everybody to be nice to each other and get along and everybody have a place in society. But no, no, this trans activists, they're push, push, pushing. They're pushing people too far. The laws have got to be changed. They've got to be changed. Uh, when women start waking up, believe me, there's going to be another suffrage. And it's going to be all colors of women, not just white women, Kyla. Jim, and actually trace it from the 19th century all the way you know, to the present day. And so I kind of wanted to start there and ask you maybe to share with us, like, how do you define that sort of entity that's sort of stable enough and yet remarkably flexible, right? Mm -hmm. And that's able to change and almost like camouflage itself. Like it's such a chameleon. Um, and I think that speaks to why it's been so persistent. But like, what is this thing, white feminism, if this isn't just sort of, a, oh, white women are causing, you know, trouble again, but this is actually like a oh. real thing in the world. So yeah, I wonder if you could kind of share with us that kind of sneak peek into what the book talks about. Yeah, um, well, you know, like you, like a historically minded researcher who spends a, you know, a fair amount of time in archives and also just really wants our hands in the raw sources from the time period we're talking about before I feel comfortable saying what anything is, right? And I was, was really captivated by this term, white feminism, that has become so popular in the last five or so years. Because it is relatively brand new, you know, it was it was a term used by some indigenous feminists and Chicana feminists in the 1980s, but it didn't really take off as a descriptor. Um, 
that would explain why I'm just now hearing about it today. But now we see it everywhere. And it is. I don't know where we see it everywhere. I don't get out of the house much. So that could be it. Maybe I'm not understanding it, but I did a little bit of uh, Googling about this. And uh, it's something to do with this trans movement thing. Um, if it's still on my computer, I'll pop it up there. If it's not, then when I watch this video again in the future, I'll know I wanted to look for it. It is so useful as a way to describe a kind of feminism that prioritizes white women. But that also didn't quite go far enough. I wanted to understand what is it really, right? Um, and I suspected that the typical problem with white feminism that we often discuss, which is that it ignores women of color, but that doesn't actually go far enough in capturing its harm, right? Because most forms of oppressive power structures um, don't do their, don't amass power by ignoring others. They amass power by taking it from others. And what I, I don't understand what she's trying to say. <laughs> I found is that white feminism, the problem with it is not that it works through a sin of omission. It's not that it ignores poor women, black women, indigenous women, other women of color, trans women. It's that it actually... We want to ignore trans women. We don't want the trans movement taking over the future generations of children. Do you not see how this is weakening the country? Not alone ruining your, you know, your chances for grandchildren. When these trans transgendered people get old and all of their transgendered friends are also elderly and who the heck knows what the next generation is going to be like to them, how they are to us, you know, seeing how that is. Uh, you know, when you're elderly, you hope that you have grandchildren that can come help you, you know, call you, you know, be there for you. And I see that, that the transgendered people are going to be very lonely when they get older. You know, they're going to steal other people's kids. There's just so many bad ways this is, this is going to go. I just don't see any way that this is going to turn out and everything's going to be wonderful. If we go, okay, let's trans all the kids. That sounds like a great idea. I think you're going to have a lot of really, 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 really disappointed people and angry because they're training them to be little instigated, instigator, pissed off, you know, little punks. Uh, imagine how they're going to feel, all these mad people, <laughs> when they realize what has been done to them. You guys are being gaslit. You're being lied to and you're being brainwashed. He uses more marginalized people as raw fuel to drive their own success. And it That's the way it has been from the beginning of time. That's slavery, raw materials. Back in the uh, 17s, 16s, 15s, if you were rich enough or strong enough, you're going to make somebody do your laundry. That's just human nature. That's what I believe is human nature from all the history shows I've seen. You know, that's like we have a dishwasher now. They didn't have a dishwasher then. They thought, well, I'm more powerful. You're going to wash my dishes or you're not going to live. That's just how it's been. We are part of the animal world, you know. Uh, we're part of Mother Nature, like I said before. Leave religion out of it. Leave scientists out of it. Just go look around at stuff that we don't control. Well, that that method of white feminism really stretched true across the period from the beginnings of Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony developing the approach in the 1840s and 1850s and on, all the way up to the present. Um, so that's the method, like actually using others as fuel, almost like in a vampiric way, to mm -hmm. drive your own success um, with the overall um, theory um, of that when a woman is, um, when a white woman especially, or maybe to some degree a woman is in charge of power structure, she will redeem that power structure. Mm -hmm. like if we have 
a feminist CEO, according to somebody like Sheryl Sandberg, then we have a equal system. And I found that that, you know, sanctifying, even salvific force of white feminism had not been fully appreciated and also is where its true harm lies because the goal is to try to get the top of existing power structures with the fantasy that that is what feminism was about that all the years that i've ever heard of it i have never known it to be racially motivated like only white women Never, never. As a matter of fact, everything that I'd ever gone to, every little class or meeting or <laughs> has always been about including, you know, including. We don't want to hate the gay people. You know, people have gay children that they love. That doesn't mean they want their genitals mutilated. That doesn't mean they want them to be the opposite sex. To me, this is sounding more and more like they are trying to treat mental illness. They're trying to shut kids up, you know, control them one way or the other. Uh, usually in the olden days for eugenics to uh, shut them up, they'd uh, give them a lobotomy so they just didn't talk. And they, I guess they figured out, well, that's a waste of natural resources like this lady was saying, but women didn't have anything to do with that. That was men doctors. Um, so, uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, all these ADD kids that um, they couldn't cure with Ritalin or Adderall. And I think that's the reason why there's so much drug addicts in the street. Not elderly people needing medication for real pain. That's a whole nother issue I want to get into someday. Um, I think there's a lot of scapegoats in this country is what I think. Back to this story, though. But uh so, you know, the mental institutions cost a lot of money. And it was back in the uh, early 2000s that they wanted to give uh, special needs people, you know, they said, well, you get your freedom too. You can choose, you know, if you want to live in a group home, you can. If you want to live under a bridge, you can. So they had the freedoms to make that choice. And I don't think people that can't make good choices, uh, you know, need to be um, living out under the, the bridge. You know, I don't think people should be locked up and I don't think that institutions should be bad places. But I think that they realized a lot of people that have uh, mental issues of one kind or another are very, very smart. And I think they've used, they figured out how to use them in their takeover of the, um, you know, the Western world. I don't know. That's why I'm doing these video videos. I'm watching these videos, trying to figure it out. I want to really thank you for being here and uh, watching my videos and helping me figure out too. If you have any good information, you know, let me know. Let me tell me about it in the comments. I'll Google it myself. Just tell me where to go and what to Google. Once one is in charge, that that structure is redeemed, right? Like Kirsten Gilbrand's famous joke of like, if it were Lehman sisters and not Lehman brothers, we wouldn't have had the 2008 financial collapse. And that's how white feminism ends up leaning in to racism, to, to homophobia. How does that lead us into, uh, into that? How? What are they? Wh maybe she'll tell us. Maybe she'll tell us. I don't see how uh, greedy bankers, uh, you know, gaslighting and whatever to people, lying, how that reflects on white women and racism at all. I don't see it. Let me know if you do in the comments. Thanks, Phobia. Um, to climate injustice, capitalism, etc. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's such a, I mean, thank you for that really um, bracing account. And it's, it's really remarkable, right, how this sort of maybe recent kind of cultural and especially I don't want to say pop cultural, but a kind of public kind of very online interest in um, naming something as white feminism is actually this sort of invitation to go much deeper and trace like well, where did that actually come from and what are its... I believe this is all part of uh, getting the younger generation to hate their parents, first of all, and everybody else. Why? You know, why, why does she want to talk about the past in such a bad way for white women, black women, any women with somebody that um, was not born a woman. You know, constituents, and I just, I really love this intervention to say that, you know, contrary to that sort of 
I, I just wrapped up teaching intro to, to women's studies tonight. So, you know, for anyone who's taken a class like that, you often get introduced to this sort of wave theory of that. Why is that person doing a class on women's studies? Why? I am offended. I feel like I'm being, uh, whatever the other part of the other half of racism is. I'm personally offended by that. Uh, I, the women in my family and the women in my life, I've seen them go through a lot of stuff and grow through a lot of stuff when they were born a girl and they continued being a girl and went through real women's issues, not 1970 therapy lady wannabe transgendered professor, associate professor. Feminism, oh, there was the first wave. Those are the suffragettes. And yes, they, they were white women. So, you know, they didn't, they didn't think about anyone else. You know what? The, rule, the rules were made by the men and the blacks still had no, no rights back then. I don't know how the women could have uh, brought any black person into it. I don't know. It was a terrible time in history, but that has nothing to do with me. I'm a white woman in 2023. I was born a girl and now I'm a woman the whole time. So I think that my opinion does hold weight against these two. Right, and then second wave, well, they, they were also white women, actually. <laughs> also kind of didn't really think about anyone else. But then finally, you know, sometime in, who knows, the 1980s, the 1990s, we got to the third wave, and, and now things are finally starting to change. And that, that narrative itself is so patently untrue. It was one invented, right, one invented and reflective of the investments of certain white feminists who wanted to cement kind of like after the fact, that salvific, you know, kind of yeah. by proving that, ah, oh, by the 80s and the 90s, white women finally realized their mistakes. When in fact, part of what you're showing here, I think this leads me to my next question, is that white feminism isn't just this sort of island, right, that formed on its own and had no regard for any other groups, you know, particularly in the United States. On the contrary, white feminism is constantly defined through its attempt to extract value, particularly out of um, African Americans and indigenous people. Is he saying that uh, white women are still buying slaves? Is that the, um, I'm not gonna be able to get all the way through this show. I'm gonna put the link down in the description and in the comments so you can go watch it too, but oh my gosh. Right. But um, but also, you know, is constantly engaged in sort of battles around racial supremacy and racial governance. Right. So but one of the things that I think is really important about this book and, and that, you know, I really want to underline is that we get this sort of important history of white feminism that we haven't seen before. But you do something really smart, which is that you pair it all the way along with what you call, you know, this counter history of another kind of feminism. Oh. Which we, you know, today tend to call intersectional feminism, oh. drawing on the, the work of Black. Uh, I just uh, heard of that one today, too, and I Googled that one, too. Maybe that's the one I actually Googled. Feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, right? But that you really chart this, again, like two centuries long history of intersectional feminism. And what's so interesting to me, right, is that there we actually see the roots of this alternative feminist movement that, you know, where Black women are at the center, but also Indigenous women, right? This whole cast of characters, trans masculine people, trans women, uh, you know, immigrants, working class people, right? That you, you sort of are able to both treat this kind of dominant class, the white women, but you also actually, you know, show the cards of all the others who are working against them. Um, but in a way that I think is really complex. I yeah. more to ask about that, but but maybe first, like, could you could you give a sense of like, yeah, how you treat this sort of long lineage of intersectional feminism and maybe how you see it contrasting with um, white feminism? Because I think it's a really innovative formulation that, you know, I think people are, like, even historians are not necessarily familiar with or don't come and think that way. Right? Like, that we're aware of these historical figures that you talk about, say, from the 19th century. Right. Um, but 
don't necessarily apply that label, intersectional feminist. So could you talk us through yeah. that? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, this what this that structure of each mm-hmm. chapter having an icon, white woman feminist like this is Katie Stanton, Margaret Sanger, Betty Friedan, you know, Cheryl Sandberg, but contrasted, you know, with within each chapter. Okay, I'm gonna uh, pause it there. I disagree with them. I disagree with, you know, quite a few of the things they're saying. Uh, She wrote the book called The Trouble with White Women. And uh, that intrigued me, along with I've been watching videos about jewels. And, uh, well, I thought, well, what is the trouble with white women? So she gives her little narrative and her opinion, and I want to give my narrative of my opinion. I'm a woman. I've been a white woman my whole life. And, uh, yeah, I don't think that she's taken into consideration that. But, um, you know, it, it was a struggle for everybody. It was a struggle for everybody. Life now is the easiest it's been in any time of history, unless you were a king or a queen, you know, or really, really, really rich. It's a struggle. It's a day-to-day struggle. That's what they went through. They didn't have all the conveniences that we had. And I would like to know... Where are all the dead children throughout history because they were trans and they killed themselves? If it's always been such a big thing. I think I would read in history that children were mysteriously killing themselves and nobody could figure out why. So maybe somebody out there in YouTube land has an answer for me about that because, you know, if there are, let me know. (laughs) I don't think there is. I've watched a lot of history shows throughout the pandemic, a lot, and there I have not seen one thing about pandemics of kids killing themselves in massive droves around the world at puberty for no known reason. You know, I'm not saying no kids ever kill themselves, but I don't think that they all, there would be a lot more of what these people say is, you know, the truth, which it is not. And the only thing I can figure that is, you know, the end game of this little experiment we're doing is uh, our population will be less because they're not having children and they're taking other people's children. So they'll be, you know, sterilizing those children, too. So I see a lot of that. And then after that, I don't know what it's going to take for what generation to wake up and say, I don't want that life. You know, um, the one girl I watch, um, Carlin, uh, Carlin Borsinkio, I have to think about how to say her name. She talks about that they don't care that they don't have their own children because they're going to take everybody else's. And I believe that's true. (laughs) But, uh, they, I guess that they're not smart enough to think further ahead that, you know, if humanity is going to continue here. That's the way it's always been done. They can store up frozen eggs and store up frozen sperm. You know, they could probably store quite a bit of it, but it seems to me like they're trying to get it to where, uh, you know, somebody wants to take over our place here on Earth. Um, Not everywhere, but in the UK... In here in the United States, in Canada, I haven't heard much about Mexico. In China, it's a no. In Russia, it's a no. So why are some of these places pushing it like it's the new best thing and other places banning it? Why? Because they know what's going on. And I think so many people in this country are on drugs, antidepressants, uh, Ritalin's, Psychotic drugs, you know, I'm not, you know, no drug person, you know, but I do think that those are affecting society. And I watched a show about how some towns cannot even filter out the birth control pills, the estrogen out of the drinking water in towns. I don't know if one of my town is one of those towns, but I, uh, you know, I'd not heard that before and I haven't researched it anymore. So feel free. I probably will at some point. Will I make a video about it? I have no idea. If you're, 
If you're curious, ask me in the comments. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that's why, uh, you know, men are getting softer. Because they kind of are. Now they want to be women. How much softer can you get? Do they want to go clear back to infancy and be breastfed? See, I just start talking about this and then I just kind of get wound up and I don't want, I don't want to get wound up, but seriously, this is a serious issue. And, uh, you know, I hope all of you are telling your friends and your family, uh, the ones that you're safe to talk to about that. It's, it's become where, uh, everything is so, uh, Accurate, you know, like if you, I feel like that I worry that I would say the wrong thing and offend the wrong group is what I feel like. That's why I'm wearing this. You know, I just don't want John PQ public knowing who I am. So, you know, I have friends that are, that made the trans and, uh, I have my own feelings about it. And uh, I talked to my one friend, and I'm just, uh, I'm horrified about why they did it, or doing it in the process. I'm not sure. To be honest, I haven't talked to them that much about it, because I don't know what's considered offensive. So I'm, I'm in a real, uh, I don't know what to do. I'm just trying to do the best I can, um, you know. I, you know, I don't know how long a person is obligated, obligated to keep supporting someone through something that, that you feel that, you know, you know, it's not gonna, I don't know what the change they're expecting from this. I can tell you this much. They didn't do it because they've had a lifelong dream of being a woman. I could probably understand it more if it was that, but it's not. It, it's deeper than that. I believe they're using it to control mental illness. Like I said in my other